that we're, it was a lot of work to get us to this point. So our decision-making timeline is basically we released kind of a draft plan about, you know, kind of going over all the different areas that we have to think about coming back to school. Um, the plan also required that, uh, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but three categories from the state. Um, and, you know, so far we released the draft of the plan last week. We did some voluntary staff meetings um, in each of the buildings. Um, both When I talk about each of the buildings, we're talking about the middle and high here this evening, but we're also talking with the, element, the four elementary schools as well. Um, there are also, um, we did a town hall meeting last Friday just for the all the elementary schools during the day. And then each of the elementary schools are doing evening meetings this week um, with Frontiers obviously being tonight. Um, <clears throat> school committee met last week and was just kind of given an introduction of the overview of the plan. They are gonna be meeting next week on July 29th to get a more in-depth look at um, you know, we'll talk about the hybrid plan um, model and just a uh, more kind of a, a more finished product on the 29th of what school could look like this fall. And then on August 5th, we have it right now scheduled for them to make a decision on which plan we will move forward. Um, that timeline has been set by the state. Um, the state is asking us to have our final plan by the 10th. Um, and uh, they asked that I submit the three plan option, but to them by the end of the month, so by July 31st. So basically where we're at, um, and I'll talk about those plans in a minute, that's kind of our timeline. School committee has the um, right to set their own schedule, so they, they could move that date if they need to, um, you know, if they're having trouble making a decision on that um, evening, or they feel like they need more information, or whatever the story may be, it's, it's up to them. Um, but the engineer did ask for us to, the Commissioner of Education, um, Jeffrey Riley um, asked us to wait until the first week of August to make that decision for several reasons. Um, one being that, you know, COVID is kind of this fluid, fluid problem that we have, and it's going up and down, uh, hopefully only down in our state, but, you know, we want to be making that decision of how we go back to school closer um, to the date. Um, and he's also in negotiations right now, uh, the Department of Secondary Education is in negotiations with the MTA, and there may be some changes coming from those negotiations that would affect any um, any re-entry of school. So we're waiting, and those are supposed to wrap up by the end of the month, and so therefore we would have those changes to be voted on in a plan this fall. So the Department of Education required that we submit three plans. One is an in-person model, you know, for all students who choose to attend to come back into the building, and what that would look like under those parameters, those safety parameters that were in the plan. The second was to create a hybrid model where you would have some students in the building and some students were learning remotely and maybe have some sort of rotating schedule. And then finally, would a remote model, it says mode, but it's a remote model um, uh, would look like for all students um, as well. So we're gonna talk a lot about the hybrid model tonight. And the reason why is, and I'll talk about any model, but we're gonna talk the most discussion um, presenting to you um, about the hybrid model because the remote model is pretty obvious. Um, we can, we'll do some general overview of how we're planning on improving that. The in-person model, as we will, will point out, it's not very practical under the current guidelines and current budget restrictions that we have. Um, we'll talk about that. The hybrid model is the one that I think is getting the most traction um, outside of the remote model. If, either, if, we're, if we're not staying home, I believe we'd probably be looking at some sort of hybrid model. And so, you know, we're going to talk about that now. Um, so the in-person models, the key, key points here um, is we do technically have enough space at six foot seating. We have enough classrooms in the building in the middle and high school. The problem that we have is providing instructors, instructors for all those classes when you reduce the class sizes in order to have that space. Um, and then, you know, you know, particularly as it says right there, given our diverse content, we start getting into the secondary level. Um, you know, you start to have content specific, specific teachers not everyone can just pick up, um, you know, a, a textbook and teach physics or, um, you know, you know, English or any of the subjects for that matter. Um, it, it just becomes more of, um, you know, class class driven. So, so like again, like we said, we have uh, overall the space, but we can't see how to do it without hiring. Um, I think as you know, and Sarah Mitchell, please jump in. I'm going to probably hand it over to you in a second, but the um, without hiring at least probably around ten. 10 to 13 te additional teachers in specific subject area. Um, Sarah, do you wanna jump in at any point here? Yep, you've got, you've got that in-person covered. I'll jump in on the hybrid. All right, so, so basically, 
um, hybrid key, key points. So Sarah, why don't you jump right in? Sure. Um, so we're, we're really looking at this hybrid model very, very closely. Um, given all of the parameters and the safety requirements, um, it seems like the most viable option for getting students into the building. Um, and we're really hoping that the indicators in Western Massachusetts and Franklin County um, stay the way they are right now so that we can get started. We really, really want to meet our, our students. We want to build relationships with them. Um, in case we do end up in a remote situation. Uh, but the benefits of a hybrid model are we can see all of our students and they would be in our classrooms, uh, fewer of them with smaller class size. Uh, we'd have some consistent cohorts so that we could really um, work on making sure that those groups are small and we're able to keep the social distancing and all the other health requirements that are in place. It would also provide an easy transition to uh, remote learning or distance learning, um, particularly if the metrics start to get bad in our area of the state and we do end up going to uh, a remote plan. Students would have experience with what the expectations were for remote learning um, and it would serve as, as a partial training for them too. We're looking at the first week as being a week that we would do a lot of orientation with students, a lot of uh, social emotional work with students. Um, they've been out of the classroom for a long time and we're really mm -hmm. going to need to ease in the population um, to the school to get them used to the new school routines, which are going to be many. Um, and we're mm -hmm. looking also as those half days as a way to give faculty an opportunity to really tease mm -hmm. out some of the logistics. So we do day one of orientation and then the faculty reflect on what can we change for day two with the second half of the cohort. So we're looking at August 27th through September 3rd, it's approximately six days of doing half days and bringing about half of our population into the building on any given day. Um, and we'll spread that out across those six days. And again, it's or orientation and getting students used to um, the routine. And Sarah, I'm just going to, going to pause you for a second, and I just want to emphasize, this is a draft of a plan that's open for discussion. So when you start seeing dates and times, people think or start to think like, well, it looks like they've already cemented this. No, we're just, we're just showing it. We're putting some facts into it to show that what it would look like. So I just want to reemphasize that the, the, no decision has been made, and this could get all changed by, for example, I understand that one of the big negotiating things that's happening at the MTA um, with the state is extending the amount of professional development for teachers at the beginning of the school year. So we might have more days offered to us by the state and that might change some of these dates you see here. So I just want people not to be jotting things down into their counseling their calendars because this could change. And it also could change because of the decision making uh, moving forward as well. This is just one of the three options moving forward. I'm sorry, is that gone? Can someone yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a very good point. <clears throat> Great. So if you could move us along a slide, yep. that'd be great. Um, so again, thank you for, um, for emphasizing that, Darius, because that's very true. A lot of this can change, um, especially over the next few weeks as we see what happens, even with the state numbers. Um, and we may end up with any of these three models. Um, what we've tried to do is flesh out a model as completely as we could to give a really firm sample of what it could look like. But again, it's, it is very, very much in a draft format. Um, so we're looking at um, phase two of this hybrid model, again, we're still in the hybrid model, would be bringing in students for instruction for regular classes. And we would anticipate that that would happen after the initial six days of orientation. And we're really looking at students to come in um, two days a week with three days of remote learning. And some of these details are yet to be flushed out about the particulars of this, um, but one of the suggestions that's out there is that we bring middle school students in um, as teams. Um, so we've done a lot of um, configuring so that we can get students having the same four core content teachers. And so we've got three groups that have uh, four teachers each, and that will help us to navigate this as far as our scheduling. And then for high school, we're really looking at bringing in half of the population. We have this theory that we can do it by last name. And again, there's loads of details to be worked out because we don't want to end up with a split where there's four students in one half of 
the class and then there's 20 students in the other half of the class. So we're going to have to see how the alphabet split works um, exactly for students. And again, we're, we're still working out some of those details. And then phase three, um, and again, phase two is kind of an undetermined length because it's going to really depend on what's happening statewide and what kind of advice and guidance we get from um, the Department of Education. But we're looking to increase those numbers of days so that we're slowly working towards um, a full schedule with the understanding that we could go backwards at any time. So we may get to phase three, all is going swimmingly, and we have to slip back to phase two, or we have to move to remote learning. Yeah. Um, you know, if a vaccine is uh, developed, we may be looking at um, in the spring moving to, you know, phase four. That's not phase four. But that's a wonderful picture, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in phase four is, is much like Massachusetts phase four in the sense of that's the full return to normalcy um, that there's some there's a vaccination out there. Um, the picture here was, um, you know, we we did an outdoor we did a uh, summer school program with about twelve students this uh, last week, um, and we we start, you know we had a trial run out. What is this? What is, could this look like? And um, while this picture kind of looks, uh, it's kind of some, it has, a, it has a mixed emotion. Some people say it looks kind of bleak, and other people say we're so happy to see kids back. But I got to tell you, the the you know, Sarah, you could probably tell the story better since you were on the front. You were the one who told me the story, but the emotion part about students coming back and the importance of that um, is something that we're, you know, you're constantly considering. Um, you want to just jump in and say that? Yeah. So, you know, it was it was interesting. Um, so it's a two week program, um, and we offered it both in person and remote. So some students are participating in uh, remote. Um, learning this summer and it was a great opportunity to have a group of students in we're gathering the teachers feedback every day and the students feedback every day about their experiences uh, we're doing it mostly outdoors um, but day one everyone's deer in the headlights I mean students haven't been in the building for a long time we did um, emphasize outdoor education and that is the front of our school um, and we're doing um, probably 90% of it outdoors um, Although yesterday and today were a little tricky because it was so, so hot that we ended up moving into some air conditioned space. Um, students are wearing masks and it's just, it's wonderful to see kids. And they were exhausted by the end of the first week. It's only a two hour each morning program, um, but they were all tired because it's, it takes a lot of energy to be amongst your peers. But we had uh, several students that had signed up for particular days and they added days to the schedule because they really were enjoying being with each other and um, being without around other students. Um, so it's just, it, it warms my heart. I I'm sad to see them all sitting in mass, but I, they also are having such a great time with the program that it makes me happy to see them back in the building. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to show that because we are having, we, we do have a little bit of um, firsthand experience as we're doing this. And then the remote learning, um, the key point of the remote learning, Sarah, you want to go through that slide too, since you Sure. So we really are looking to um, strengthen our remote learning model. So last spring when we were shut down, we initially were shut down for two weeks and then it was a month. And then all of a sudden it was the, through the end of the school year. So we didn't really have the best opportunity to put something in place that was going to be um, to make every student successful with remote learning. Um, the good news is we got to reflect a lot on that. And we've gotten to do a lot of um, reading and research on best practices with remote learning. And we're planning on continuing that as we roll into the fall, because we do anticipate that there will may be a time that we're going to be in full remote learning again. So some of those key components for middle and high school students is um, doing synchronous learning. So having a teacher that is actually um, teaching at the same time consistently every day so that students have a very routine schedule. And then attendance and grading at the secondary level really becomes important in um, motivating students to continue and keep up with their schoolwork. We have purchased an online tool, Schoology, which we're hoping is going to help us, um, especially with parent communication. We saw that as a, a place that we really need to um, beef up and improve. And Schoology, uh, we're hoping, is going to help us do that. It's a learning management system similar to Google Classroom, but it has some features that Google Classroom doesn't have, uh, such as breakout rooms so that we can do small groups 
um, and really kind of take advantage of a product that will give us more bells and whistles. Any, the last two points there on that slide, Sarah, you talked about more synchronous learning where students are um, learning at the same time during the day with a set schedule. And then obviously uh, attendance and grading needs to be beefed up right out of the, out of the, uh, out of the gate where before, you know, the spring it was about, you know, providing opportunities and then we kind of had to bring it back around. It will not be the same way um, this fall from the remote setting. Right, sir? Yeah. Yes. The next um, thing I want to talk about is our special populations. Um, and is, is Karen, Karen, are you on? I can't see because I might screen up. Yes, sure, sure. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Karen. So I'm, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm jumping out of my presentation mode so that people can see your face. But it's so rude I'm doing. That's okay. <laughs> mm. All right. It's my face. <laughs> So Karen, you want to talk a little bit about your the, the uh, SPED, uh, strategic planning and CPAC a little bit, what, what they're asking for some um, more interest and help there? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my screen. Um, as you know, uh, I, my name is Karen Ferrandino. I'm the director of special education. I've been here for 12 years, um, and we have done, uh, and I'm very proud of the continuum of services we've had at Frontier um, in special education. And as we entered deeper and deeper into our uh, thinking about opening for next year, two things happen. Uh, one is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education put out a supplemental guidance for special education. So really, um, when you think of special education, it's not completely separate than general education, it's, it, but it does have supplemental uh, services attached to it for students on IEPs. The other thing that happened is we have a well-organized CPAC, Special Education Parent Advisory Council, insightful, um, organized, uh, thoughtful uh, CPAC. And they had put out a letter just asking to meet with administrators and requesting to be more actively involved um, in the design and implementation of our three models as we look into next year. And so thinking about that, we decided that the best thing to do was to pull together a special education strategic planning committee. Um, at this time, it is going to have a number of administrators, parents, faculty from all the schools, and related service providers, that's your speech language pathologist, your psychologists, uh, occupational therapists, people who are not uh, teachers. We're all going to join together um, in a special education strategic planning committee. Meet three times this summer and continuously throughout next year. Uh, because as you can see from what Darius and Sarah are unfolding, it's always going to be a process. We're always going to look at what we can prove if we're developing an in-person model, how we increase those in-person services, and really taking into account the data and feedback as we move along. So we're excited about pulling together that um, strategic planning committee, uh, excited about the response we got when we reached out to parents and faculty and administrators. It is going to be facilitated by Sharon Jones, uh, who's a facilitator, a uh, instruction and curriculum uh, specialist with the Collaborative for Educational Services. Uh, and just thinking having her as a facilitator with such a diverse group to really pull out those various perspectives. Understanding we have strengths, we do have areas of need. Uh, we will define um, our mission and our avenues to be able to get there and be able to present a comprehensive strategic plan uh, upon its completion. I am in, out here in the crowd of 153 people. So as we move along in today's presentation, if you have any specific questions related to special education, or um, you can always reach me. My name is Karen Ferrandino. It's you can reach out to me by email. Uh, you can find me on the web. I'm totally accessible to ask specific questions uh, to regards to our continuum of services for special education. And I noticed Holly's out there uh, and in the chat um, from our CPAC um, and he wants to make a brief comment. Uh, so I'll acknowledge that. Uh, so we'll give Holly the floor and then if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to direct them to me uh, directly. Holly. Hi, um, my name is Holly Johnson. I am the co-chair of the CPAC, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council that Karen uh, was just talking about. I also have a, a daughter going into 10th grade at Frontier. 
Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we what we do as a CPAC. Every district is required to have one, and we have one CPAC for the whole district. It covers high school, middle school, and all four elementary schools, and we work with administration and the planning process, and we serve as kind of a, a support group. We are having a meeting coming up Monday, um, July 27th at 6 p.m. We're going to discuss the strategic planning committee and we're going to be picking representatives, parent representatives. Um, I don't think we have anyone who has volunteered from at the high school level yet. So if anyone is interested, please reach out to us um, and we can give you a link to the meeting if you would like to attend. And then the first strategic planning committee meeting is July 31st. So we're hoping to have all our representatives picked by then. I'm gonna go ahead and put um, the CPAC's email address in the comments and please reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Um, I'm not gonna um, jump in and share my screen again because there's only two slides left before we go into questions, but <clears throat> um, you know what, Holly, could you also make sure we get the link and I can post that on the website so if people change their mind and they have to reach out to you to get the link so they can, if that's okay. If it's not okay, you can um, I believe Rhonda yep. has all that information. Um, that's the person I'd give it to. Right in front of me right Probably now. Rhonda. Rhonda yep. does have it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then, so, you know, as part of this process, we are asking for feedback from families, not only this evening, but if you don't um, want to talk this evening or if you've already submitted um, the form that we sent with the reopening plan, you know, uh, questions, comments, concerns, um, we really do appreciate them. It is helping us uh, mold our directions. Um, and um, I just want to talk about some of the themes we have, which will kind of be a, a primer to questions from all of you. Um, you know, some of the themes that we've heard is, you know, the options for remote learning for all families. So one of the things, I'm not sure if we said it, but I'm not sure we emphasized it. The state has said that public schools will provide a remote learning option if a family does not feel comfortable coming back to school. So even in the hybrid model, which is a both a remote and in-person, um, one could also choose just remote and not be part of the in-person um, model there. And it may, that particular model, as we're still defining, it may be a different, um, maybe a different teacher teaching that course um, in that remote setting because it will be different than the hybrid model, which is on and off there. But I just wanna make sure I'm very clear about there is a remote option for all families. Um, we heard back from parents that the hybrid and remote model challenge is challenging for working parents, um, you know, having to support um, students in their learning and also with childcare. Um, we've heard of a, a varying views on face masks and the requiring of face masks. I will be, I'm pretty, pretty strong up front about that. I'm certainly take questions, but um, in order to create a safe community and a community that we're all working on the same page there is that all students will be required to wear a face mask unless there is a um, disability, a documented disability um, that's worked out with, worked and discussed with the school that makes it um, not able to happen. Um, you know, it's, you know, face masks are, are protecting, um, a, you know, the spreading it's from you going out and so I think if, if the idea that, you know, we're all in this together and we create a, um, a set of rules that our community is going to follow so that we can get students back in the building and everyone can feel safe. Um, <clears throat> and schools will have plenty of black masks. We've already ordered some and a lot of people have been sewing and donating them to us as well. Um, assurance that there's going to be proper health and safety training. That's one of the key components behind our plan is to put it out there to show that we're putting all those the thoughts and ideas into all the safety measures. Special education support and services, you know, we, we had a lot of concern about that and that's why we're putting this that special um, uh, committee together as well to oversee that to make sure that we don't miss any steps there. Um, trainings and resources for technology and second steps. So uh, we heard from families that if there is a remote thing, are you going to give us some, some, uh, some teaching, uh, some, are you gonna teach us on how to use the Schoology and, and all these other kind of things and we've heard that and we'll be setting up the need for ongoing um, orientations for families and, um, and such there. Um, more information about outdoor learning. So we'll, we'll talk more about that, but we really wanna keep our kids outdoors as much as possible. Um, we're really pushing that, you know, classes be outdoors. We're talking about tent setups and different um, options, especially because when we can get outdoors, the masks can come off easier um, and mask breaks as well. I didn't talk about that when we talk about the, the views on masks. You know, we're, we're considering all that 
as well. We know that the last thing we want to do is have students come into the building, have a mask on, sit at a desk for, for five hours. That is not what we want education to be. We want education to be um, inviting um, and uh, fun and, you know, kind of, you know, creating those connections that are so important. Um, we received questions how the cohorts will be grouped. As you heard, we're still working on that. And then on top of all that, it's kind of funny, it's the last one, provide a ma and maintain a rigorous, a rigorous education uh, learning experience and learning experience. So um, on top of all that, we need to do that as well. Um, so, um, you know, that's the thoughts there. And then my final slide, which I don't need to put up, but we are also going to be reaching out to the community um, and asking for help in the sense of uh, materials and stuff for outdoors, maybe, you know, you know, easy seating and that kind of stuff that you may have that you've done because summer will be over. Sorry, you'll be the fall and maybe you're not using it as much. And so George will be putting it together. George and Sarah will be putting together um, a request going out to families to uh, ask for certain things. If you have the means, you know, and you're able to um, provide, you know, you can, you know, connect with your building principal. If you have elementary children, um, the same thing's going to be going out there as well. Because it is one of these things, this, is a, this pandemic is not something that we ask for. It's something that we all have to work through together, though, you know. And so um, that's the idea there is using our community resources in that way. So be expecting receiving that as we get closer, knowing what our plans are for the fall. So with that, we're going to go into some, um, some Q&A. And Scott is going to be our, our host. He's going to read, read the questions out loud. And then um, we're going to, the administrators are all going to point at each other and try to get the other person to answer the question. No, we will um, try to uh, put that up to the person who probably best knows the answer and then help each other out if necessary. Scott, I am looking at Joe, by the way, who has the best seat in the house. Can everybody see him? But you can't stare at a screen too long because you're going to get seasick. All right, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, uh, uh, Sure. Uh, first question is from Diane Cassidy. Are these options only for the first six weeks or the whole school year? Excellent question. Um, the way we see it is that, um, and we're going to have to put in clear language around this, is that we can't have students coming back and forth week to week. So if you decide to sign up for the hybrid plan, you, let's say we go with the hybrid plan. Right now, it looks like it's going to be a hybrid or remote plan. Just let's just be honest that this way the, 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 the tea leaves are reading. Um, you know, if you sign up for the hybrid, if you, if you sign up for the remote plan, you can't decide the next week to come back to the hybrid plan. We're going to have to have set um, re-entry dates because we're going to be basing our um, our numbers of, you know, how we're doing things based on student numbers and that kind of thing. It's also an interruption in the curriculum. So it, it may not be until the quarter break. So you might be taking the first quarter off and doing that remotely and then coming in there. But we're still working out that that detail. Um, and again, if that's, if that's the route that's chosen. Um, did, that, did I just ask Scott, you think? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, you answered the second one there from, um, uh, who is it, uh, Denise Boudreaux, about starting with remote and then switching back to hybrid. So I'll move along. Um, no band or chorus, I suppose, from Anonymous? So right now, DESE's um, guidance, and DESE is the Department of Education, um, Department of Elementary, Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, right now, is their, their guidance on that is no. Um, you know, in the sense, but they're trying to, you can maybe do outdoors um, or with screen distances. So we're still figuring out how we're going to do, um, you know, the uh, chorus and wind instruments and how that would work within the schedule. So I'm um, still figuring that out. Uh, next question from Bill Marapizzi. Has DESE provided any accommodations to allow for virtual MCAS administration? Long way away, DESE is still, um, they're still fighting over whether or not they'll, they'll do MCAS next year. Um, the thing I got to tell you about MCAS is a quick, give you way too much information, but I'll be quick. It's a federal mandate, it connects to federal funding, so you have to apply to the federal government to waive MCAS. So they do it very, it's also, I believe, a state law as well that you have to take the MCAS. So they have to have multiple legislation to, to make the, to, to just cancel that. So it is being discussed at the um, the MTA, you know, had that on their list of things discussing to discuss with them. MCAS is not until the spring, so we're worried about just getting the kids back in the door. We're worried about, I don't worry about MCAS overall um, as a test for this district. is a measure. It's one measurement tool. We do very well in it overall. Um, it does help us um, at times you know, as a measurement, but I, I'm not worried about that right now. And hopefully families shouldn't be yet worried about MCAS. <clears throat> 
Thank you. Next question from Matt Fuller. Are there thresholds established for COVID cases or rates that would require the school to move from the hybrid to the remote learning model? And how would that hit, how would the school handle the communication of any um, positive cases or exposure? Good questions. So the guidance from DESE came out late Friday. So those of you who were on the Friday, uh, the last Friday call, we actually have more information since then. Um, our nurse leader, Meg Birch, is digesting that. Um, is Meg on? Any chance? If, if you want to jump in, Meg, you can. If you're not, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to keep going. So we are trying to raise the threshold. There you are, Meg. I'm on. Um, All right. You want, you want to jump in? You can finish your sentence, and then I can jump in. Okay. So Meg's working out. We're trying to build thresholds so it's not this kind of um, calling us calling a snow day. If you, if you want to know how that works, you know, um, in the sense of, you know, I go outside, I ask 12 people and, you know, that kind of thing, and I hit in an aha. We really want to have clear data points that we're going to be working off of um, on how we make those decisions. Also, DESE released that will be added to the plan if it isn't already, I know Meg was working on it today, um, you know, indicators from the community and indicators in the school about what would what would require a shutdown of um, of the school or a particular part of the school. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about that? Yep. Okay. So um, in in the guidance, and I think this is a really important part of um, of the planning is um, for any infectious disease outbreak, we work closely with the local boards of health and the public health nurses. They're actually the ones who will get the notification of a positive test result. And they are the ones, whether it's a local public health nurse or it's the contact tracing organization from the state that will contact a staff person or a family to report that positive. If a family reports the result to us or a staff person re reports the result to us, um, we, then that's the other way we would have the information. But what we are looking at very carefully is, um, and we were playing with the language of it, is, is a sort of a low tolerance for risk is how I'm thinking about it in terms of, have I frozen? No. Nope. Nope. Um, uh, in terms of how we respond to a case. So one of the reasons we're doing the cohorts is so that we can very quickly identify who um, had potential exposure or potential cl uh, contact, close contact is, is the term that DPH uh, uses. Um, and those families will be notified. Um, and depending on how that, depending on those contacts within a, within a given school, um, that, that information will be shared more broadly. Um, that there was a positive result. Um, one of the things that we're we're working on is um, is looking at okay, does that then trigger a one to three day closure? And again, as Darius said earlier, this is all early. This is all drafts. This is this, and this is a point where we're we're teasing out those details. Um, I do have questions um, submitted to DPH. They didn't answer them on the statewide call today. They deferred all the school questions um, to Friday, um, which was disappointing <laughs> um, because I'm asking them specifically for what measures they expect us to use and what threshold. Um, trying to think if there's something else you want me to speak to in that. We are really looking at safety and wellness as the primary driving forces. And I'll, parents that know me from Conway know that, you know, my feeling is if you're going to call me and say, should my kid come to school today? The answer is no. And so for this, there's going to be daily screenings. And if you're not sure or if you, or as a staff person or if you're a um, family member and you're not sure your student should go, the answer is going to be no. Um, any doubt uh, that the, uh, the, we'll stay home. And um, we'll close if we need to. Thank you, Meg. Scott? All right, next question from Melissa Sibley. Will school choice be affected if a student chooses the remote option? <clears throat> no, you'd be enrolled in our, um, you'd be, you'd, as a school choice student, you're still our student. You'd be, you would be part of our remote option and still a school choice, school choice student. Thank you. Next question from Lynn Faith Rose. What can you tell us about the ventilation system and how you will address airborne transmission of the virus? Will you increase ventilation 
or air changes per hour? We are currently having um, Frontiers, uh, our, our HVAC vendor is going through, um, actually was in a meeting today and I approved the, the, the spending to, to go forward and do that. We are going through all the ventilators. Each classroom has an external ventilator. Um, I almost turned my camera, you could see one, and vents the outdoors. Um, they're going to go through and make sure the, the amount of oxygen that's coming in through those ventilators is what is being shown on the computer screen, and it will be increasing those. Um, so, you know, those particular things. They're also going to go through and check all the other spaces that um, may be using shared air, that's different, uh, some more odd classroom spaces, then we'll be determining whether or not those will be used for, for teaching and instruction based on the, that report. So that's been going through, you know, probably starting next week at the end of this week, maybe when they get here. Great. Uh, next question is from uh, Elizabeth Warden. Is there any indication from the MIAA as to the fate of fall sports? And I can probably take that one since I um, handled that today. Um, the MIAA decided, their executive board decided based on the recommendations of their COVID-19 uh, task force to push back the start of the fall sports season till September 14th. The decision uh, as to what sports will be played, if any at all, lies in the hands of the Department of Education and the governor's office. And if they decide that they will allow fall sports, they will kick it back to the MIAA to develop um, reopening plans and guidelines that would be sport specific to each individual sport based on their level of risk. And that decision is not probably going to be made until uh, around the first week of August. Hey, Scott, what does that mean in the sense of, does that mean uh, September 14th means they're not allowed to practice at that, up until that point, so you're not allowed to start at all? Is that what that means? Yeah, correct. Um, Preseason would begin on September 14th, uh, practices. School-sanctioned practices and events would begin on September 14th. Um, the reason why the MIA did that was because they didn't want uh, sports to start at the same time as school opening plans. They wanted to make sure that schools were able to get their plans in place and roll out and orient kids to the start of school and then focus on sports if, if possible. Thank you. Yep. Uh, next question from Don Kemp. Will there be any ideas of having seventh graders touring the school prior to school starting? Darius, I can touch on that. I know we've had a couple of requests. So one of the things that we're considering is, is we're considering uh, possibly doing um, one to one uh, tours if need be, uh, but we're not looking at doing group tours right now. Um, so uh, we're going to Scott and I have to talk a little bit more about that, but uh, doing an entire group tour right now doesn't look like it's going to be happening. But I will just throw in, as, as, as Sarah discussed earlier, that the orientation schedule is a lot different than it was in years past, where we did the ice cream social the night before, kids could see the building, and then like, then you're boom, day one, where you get dropped off in front of the building, and you're like, oh my goodness, it's going to be, um, the orientation schedule is put into place so that there is um, that, uh, you know, kind of hand holding without actually holding hands, um, you know, to kind of to restart the school year over a couple of days. So, um, so it's going to look different, but it's not going to, it's, we still have that in mind. Next question from Jerry LeVay. Will hybrid just be the core classes? I mean, the hybrid model? No, we're, we are looking at a, um, offering um, at the high school, the full range of classes. That's our plan at the moment. Obviously there'll be a couple of exceptions um, if we can't, run band and chorus, um, but we are still looking at options even for running those classes, even if it ends up being a, a remote option. At the middle school level, um, we will probably have a reduced number of exploratories um, so that we can try to stay true to the cohorts that we create. Um, so the forms that uh, families in eighth grade fill out every year to choose um, exploratories may be shifted a little bit as we try to work out those details, but we, we do, all, continue to have a commitment to the arts at Frontier and have a commitment to our other um, non-core academics uh, to keep students um, engaged in classes that they're really interested in taking. Um, but details to come. And I believe we just kind of answered this, but there's a couple of parents back to back that are asking would be any type of phys ed um, 
and other exploratories like woodshop and such. So um, I think we I think we just covered that though. Okay, next question from Faith Perkins. Will siblings be able to be in the school or hybrid together on the same days at all levels, elementary through middle and high? So in a perfect world, that's the way we would want it to be. Um, because we're dealing with so many scheduling complications, um, I think it, there aren't going to be any guarantees. I mean, we're going to do the best we can to try to line up some things, but we've got so many moving parts that I think we are going to end up disappointing many, many families by having uh, schedules that don't line up exactly. And that's, that's not what we want, but that's the way it may end up being. And I also know at the elementary level, they are trying to make sure that all siblings can be in the building at the same time as well as a consideration they're, they're, they're taking seriously as well. But as Sarah said, there's so many different, you know, everybody, you know, you, you had the full mix up of you'd have every, you know, every class is, a, you know, a sibling in every single class and at some level. So they're working with that, though, at the elementary level as well. So at least in the elementary, the same the younger students would be in the same um, same cohort of students coming to the building that day. Great. Next question from Pixie Holbrook. How will you manage bathroom breaks for um, like K through six and seven through 12? I think we'll speak specifically to seven through 12 here in this forum. Um, and I can jump in and answer that from an operations standpoint. Um, easier done in, in high school where we can have the hall monitors uh, monitoring um, the appropriate amount of people entering bathrooms. It'll probably be a little more uh, sanctioned and supervised in the middle school because it is tricky with distancing. Um, and I think what we'll probably end up doing is, is some, it's, there's different types of bathrooms in the building. Some have singular, there's still some with urinals. Um, we'll probably close off one of the two urinals and, and minimize the use um, in that way. And, and so that will be managed properly. Next question from Matt Fuller. Um, will the school be monitoring students for any travel to areas with sustained COVID outbreak? Um, will there be a, a questionnaire of some sort planned to determine whether they have traveled outside the US or by cruise, which would place them at higher risk, which have quarantine requirements associated with those? Yeah, we, we talked about that, we'll, that we'd be asking families if they're leaving the state and going into high risk areas where they were, where the state is recommending 14 day of quarantine that you do so before returning to the public school environment. Um, and, um, you know, we'd be doing remote education during that time period. So, um, you know, taking the kids out of state, you know, in, in September and October, probably not the, the best idea. And if you're doing that, I would probably recommend that you do the remote learning um, opportunity. I'm just being, being kind of being blunt here because we're going to kind of have to kind of bring our, you know, those because they would have to quarantine because that's what the state is saying that they have to do now anyways, unless they're a protected group. <clears throat> uh, next question from uh, Boyana Dragicevich. What will it take for the school to open normally? No cases for a certain period of time or some other parameters? We don't know the answer to that. Um, because we, this is going to be dictated guidance from the state and the Department of Public Health. Um, we're kind of working with the, the information we have in front of us to, um, you know, get kids back in the building it, 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 to some degree. Because um, I, I think it's a good question when you talk about it as a community or when you talk about it as a state. It's difficult when our state is, is experiencing things far different than what California and Texas and Florida are dealing with right now. I mean, they are where we were in April. Um, where, you know, and they got there in a different way than we got there. Um, you know, maybe, you know, perhaps we're on the other end of it. And what does, what does become an equal, a, a level of normalcy to go back? Um, is it a vaccination only or is it the state going to move? And I think that's the only time going to tell on that. We certainly aren't going to be making that decision. That's going to come through a series of decisions from the state. Thank you. Next one from David Smith. Can you talk about outdoor classrooms and outdoor breaks, increasing the times to get outside um, and also in middle school, will teachers be traveling so students stay in one room or don't travel in the halls? So we are really placing a, a heavy emphasis on um, outdoor learning. Um, we do live in New England, so we understand there's going to be limitations at some point to um, how much we can do. 
Um, but we're doing things like pricing out tents and um, Scott Dredge and I walked around the campus yesterday to determine where we could put those tents. We've talked to our technology coordinator about having hotspots so that we could have internet access. Um, we're doing crazy things like talking about um, running extension cords out of windows um, because we don't necessarily have the infrastructure for that. So we're trying to think as creatively as we can because we recognize that outdoor is really vital um, to slowing this all down. And same thing with mass breaks. We're looking at building a schedule so that students get an opportunity to walk outside without their mask six feet apart. Um, we've talked about some creative um, recess type activities for middle school, um, but organized so that we can make sure we maintain that uh, social distancing. But um, it really, it's a heavy emphasis in our conversations. Thank you. All right, let me scroll back up. Next one from Johanna Hedeman. Will there be routine temperature checks of students and staff and will there be transportation offered in the hybrid model? So reverse order, transportation will be offered in, in all the models. Um, you do know that not all the models, the remote model, you can go for a ride and go back home. Um, but the uh, we were asking that question because the guidance from the state is going to ask for a reduction of those on the buses. And so being a community that um, does have um, the, the parents with the ability to drive their students to school, we asked that question. We will be asking, if we do go to re a hybrid model, we will be asking you to commit to one of those, um, to providing transportation or not. Um, but we will be having bus service um, with following the new guidelines, which will be coming out from the state as well. I know some of you are like, gosh, you guys are saying like, when it comes out from the state, that's the frustration we've been, we've been dealing with for the last six months. There is this kind of waiting game um, and we're, that's why we wanted to, you know, we prepared the skeleton structure of, with a lot of meat in it, there was a lot of meat on that plan, the reopening plan. There are some, some, some gaps that we have to fill in with the information that we didn't have, you know, and so in, in busing is one of them. So, you know, the busing, you know, the, the guidance from the busing, I've seen what other states are doing. It's going to be one per seat. It's going to be sitting staggered. Um, you know, when we talk about elementary, we may have to have bus monitors on to, to, to to start that the school year off, the secondary might look different than that. Um, so, you know, we're, so, but yes, you will be, busing will be provided um, throughout. And this next question from an unknown source, if student cannot wear a mask, will they be in a specific cohort or be advised to do remote learning for everyone's safety? Um, you know, right now, um, Unless there is a, um, you know, unless there is a medical reason for not wearing the mask, the students would be encouraged if they if they don't want to follow the, the community guidelines and the community rules to, you know, choose remote learning, because um, it's it, it, it uh, you know, we can, we can go down that road of, um, you know, our rights and that kind of stuff. But I also, um, I'm gonna have to be asking the community to, um, you know, work with the school, um, in, in the fact that in that we have to create. We have to create a system that works and if the masks are a hindrance we need to have plenty of mask breaks and we got to get students to feel comfortable in those masks and i'm not talking all from pre-k all the way up um, through that and so um, i have to have a hard line because if if, if we make it optional it defeats the purpose um, it defeat, the purpose is that we all um, are taking safety measures to slow this transmission of the disease and that we all feel safe and so um, if people are going to um, fight that rule um, or disagree with that rule. I'm being more aggressive that I probably should be there. Um, you know, you know. I think I, my job as the leader is to say this is the parameters that we're going to create, and we're going to ask everybody to follow those rules. You know, we ask people to wear shoes to school for safety reasons. We ask, you know, shirt, you know, to wear a shirt to school for safety reasons and hygiene reasons. Um, right now, the hygiene is requiring masks, and I hope I can get people to wrap their their thoughts around that um, to be part of the community. All right, next question from uh, Diane Cassidy. If a family chooses to do remote learning, can they still play sports in the fall? And I guess that is a good question. I, I think we would have to um, seek some guidance there from the MIA um, and the boards of health because we're, we would then be mixing cohorts. Um, so yeah, that's a good question, which I don't have an answer to right now. <laughs> I'm going to guess they're going to give the waiver this fall, though, Scott. I, I imagine yeah. they can't. The state can't offer to do this, and then take away the 
the privilege of being able to do athletics. So um, yep. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess it's a yes, but we'll find out the answer on that. Yeah, I think the the waiver um, is probably going to be the way to do that. Um, so so stay tuned. Uh, next one from Lynn Faith Rose, who meant to ask this earlier. Um, will will we increase the MERV rating in the filters in air handling units for rooms on shared air? That's a good question for someone who knows way too much about HVAC. So I was just having a conversation about the MERV filters in our buildings. And currently we are at a MERV 8. And the question was whether or not we can move to a MERV 13, which does not filter viruses. Okay, you know, it'll increase the air quality and filter out more, you know, um, pollens and that kind of stuff. We don't have the ability to filter um, viruses. You now we can, you know, we talked about, you know, um, doing the ultraviolet light kind of uh, filtering of air filters. It's extremely expensive. You're talking about thousand dollars a unit. You need one per each room because we each one of our units stand alone. Some of them are shared, but you know, if someone out there has too much information about people, some are shared, but it's, you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And they're not available. There's a wait list because we do want to, we talk about ordering some for specific areas that are on shared handling. So um, we're looking into that. We might be bringing the ultraviolet ones in, um, you know, for long term. But again, I'm going to, that's one of, I'm kind of on that sense of how much can money can we spend and, you know, um, how much is that going to do if you're, you know, in a classroom with other people, you know, that kind of thing. So it may reduce the risk, but will it stop the risk? Um, I'm not, I don't believe so. But. Next question from Bill Mayor PZ. <clears throat> um, will AP classes continue even if remote? Yes, uh, yeah. we have a, a really strong commitment to um, our AP classes as well as, you know, as much as our art classes that I mentioned before. So yes, we will continue our AP classes even if they're remote. And, and, I, and I just got to throw in there, that is the difficulty of high school. And it, just for everybody to wrap their heads around is each one of those electives, each one of those um, courses that people are interested in taking is what motivates students to, you know, be engaged in education. If you took away, if we stripped everything back and just did core and just did, let's, okay, we can make this, we could do something like that. And you're just going to come in for your English 9, English 10, English 11, English 12, your basic maths, your basic, you know, your history, social studies, your basic science, and remove all the electives. I think we're going to, we're in a room that the core of what education is about is, you know, going after that interest and the students engagement in those interests and also building resumes for post post graduation plans. And so we want to make sure that we include all those things moving forward as well. And so that's why that's where the difficulty is. That's, that's the give and take there, you know, so I just kind of people understanding that that's keeping all those options on the table, having all the different levels and all the, uh, you know, uh, singleton courses, you know, you have an interest in doing this one thing, but we keep that course alive because that course is, is your high school experience. And that's where we get engaged kids to go off and do great things. They get inspired somewhere, right? We got to keep that up. And perhaps the most important question of the night from Jen Stiles, what about lunch? <laughs> Sarah, do you have the outline? Uh, of that I, okay, so I, so I, I again, we're still, we're still, no, it's very, it's a very important issue and, and so it important. has been talked about a lot. This is not, I mean, he's not joking. It's, it is a huge, huge topic for all of us. Um, so initially we are thinking um, we are going to try to do lunches in the classrooms because that makes the most sense for keeping students isolated. That was the initial guidance that came out from DESE. DESE has, uh, Department of Education has now shifted a little and said, well, you could maybe do some in the cafeteria. Um, so we very much are keeping that um, in the forefront of our um, conversations. It doesn't mean that lunch won't be served, however. So we will have the capacity to serve lunches. Um, if they're in the classrooms, they might not be as fancy as they would have been in the cafeteria. But our lunch crew has done a fabulous job of feeding kids since this shutdown um, and will continue to do so through next year. And outside, we, we, you know, when we can, you know, having moving everybody outside for lunch, um, especially in September, then it gets turned a little bit different when it gets into October. Um, and, and I also talked to Mary, our, our, our lunch director, and I asked her to, you know, if we can step up lunches in the first few weeks as well, um, because the kids want their comfort food as well. So um, anyway, we're thinking about it is what I want to say. <clears throat> right. 
<clears throat> Next question from Jen Penza. What about the attendance policy? If a child needs to be out for possible COVID, will they be penalized? And I, I can take the first crack at that. Um, and the answer is no, there's no, there will be no penalty. Um, the, the, the great thing about a hybrid model is it can also be remote. So we, we are not going to be uh, following, you know, any of those, you know, state mandated um, uh, time in classroom uh, policies. Many of you have gotten letters from me in the past saying that, you know, that, that uh, your student is uh, getting close to their 10 day um, absence limit. And um, that's going to look a lot different this year. Um, that doesn't mean that it would, attendance would be a free for all. We'll be stake, taking attendance. And, and I think where the, the natural consequence of things might show up would be in the grade. However, if there's any type of illness, and especially since we're encouraging through the state uh, if you're not feeling well to stay home, then then it, it would not make much uh, sense for us to penalize people for that if you're not feeling well. So uh, our teachers will be in communication with the student and you um, to make sure that learning still continues. Anyone else want to chime in on that? No? Okay. Scott, Next Scott, question. That was yes. Go ahead, George. Okay. Um, next question from Jessica Thompson. New York has switched some spring sports to fall. Um, and has there been any conversation about this with the MIAA? There has been conversation about that. And, and I think what I'm hearing from the MIA is they really like, um, they're looking at all neighboring states models, meaning neighboring to us, um, and kind of disregarding the rest of the country due to what's happening. But I, I do know that there's there's many in the within the MIA that really like New Jersey's model and want to mirror that, which is the delayed start to seasons. But I think it's anyone's guess at this point what Governor Baker and the Department of Education will settle on. Um, but I do know that those models have been looked at at switching sports, and I and um, I think that's an interesting take on things, and it could work. Um, but we'll have to wait and see what what uh, the state says uh, that first week of August. And Scott, I just FYI, I also wrote the MIA, um, and they they were surveying superintendents about concerns in the fall. And I said, why don't you split? Why don't you swap spring and fall? Baseball, softball, track, tennis. You know, those are all sports that can. There's very far less contact, and you can you know do those out of the gate. I don't know. I don't know the politics of Eastern Mass, but Eastern Mass pretty much runs the MIA. That's true. <laughs> we'll just do what they say. <laughs> And next question from Jen Penza again, how much will the guidance counselors be available for seniors dealing with college things and how will they be available? Oh, I was going to yeah. say guidance, counsel guidance counselors will still be fully available. Uh, they'll be available if we need to have them available by remote, we can do that. But we're also looking at reconfiguring the office where there'll be a separate meeting space for uh, students uh, and guidance counselors to touch base. And so uh, they'll be completely available to help the um, to help our seniors um, navigate uh, getting into colleges. Great. Um, next question from Cheryl Risley. Uh, will there be thermal scanning of students or faculty upon entering the building daily? No. Um, straightforward answer, but uh, they're, basically they're saying that temperature is not a, uh, is too many false, false positives um, on that. We did buy point and shoot thermometers for the building if we, so we can do temperature readings faster. Um, but uh, they, they are saying that the screening of temperatures of people entering and um, entering a building is not, is not an effective screening tool. <clears throat> All right. From Denise Danak, what's the current timeline for high school students to receive information about classes they're taking, uh, especially concerned for rising seniors and fall courses offered in the cohort they're assigned to? Yeah, so we're anticipating that all courses are going to be offered at this moment in time. Um, it would be the normal uh, rollout of classes um, as far as when they get mailed home or when power school is opened up for students to see what they got um, again we're still I mean we have a lot of these answers we're still working out details uh, to determine um, how much add drop we're going to be able to do um, because if we get cohorts um, aligned and we know that we have a certain number of students um, in each half of the class 
to do a ma massive ad drop the first five days of school we could be problematic so we're really we're looking at all of that um, but right now we're not necessarily looking at canceling any classes um, with the exception of maybe moving um, band or um, chorus perhaps online or doing that remotely um, but sorry for the weak answer but there's are still details that we're working out Next question from Kelly St. Hilaire. In remote or hybrid learning, will computers be given to students if they don't have one? George, that's, another, that's an easy one, George. That's, that's, a, that's a yes. Yeah, all of our students have one-to-one. -one. We have Chromebooks for all of our students, so yeah. Next question seems like it's more for teachers from Pixie, but uh, will they get to choose remote learning or remote teaching if they have health issues or are caring for someone with health issues? Um, will teachers get to choose? We are still working that out um, with teachers. Um, so basically, we're going to have to uh, decide on the model we're going toward and, um, you know, work with, the, you know, the teaching, the teachers who, uh, the hope is that we'll be able to assign teachers who can't be in the building to help with the remote setting. So, um, I mean, that's, that's the ideal plan. Um, it all depends on numbers and, and how we work those numbers out in courses. So um, that is the difficult thing. That unknown moving forward is one of our um, is one of the difficult things. So, um, but we're working on that as well. All right. Next question from Greg Franceschi. Why are we considering hybrid option when we know it will increase the risk of kids getting infected and transmitting the virus throughout our community? Shouldn't we wait until we know it is safe instead of gambling with the lives of everyone in the community? Well, I mean, so that's that's the national debate. So we, I'm not going to open the national debate in this in this forum, but the idea that you know the level of risk versus the um, students not being in person in school, we know that in-person learning um, is far more effective than the remote learning, um, especially at the younger ages. And you know, basically, all the other the other problems that happen um, when we're not in school. So I'll throw a few of them out there just to, you know, um, I'm going to be interested to see. I'm not, our district's a little bit different than the rest of the state. Our social economic status is a little bit, a little bit higher. Um, but, you know, you start talking about when teachers make connections with students, they motivate students. And um, remote doesn't do that as effectively. And we saw that this spring in the sense of the amount of trying to get students to stay engaged. Um, you look at, you know, number of 51As in um, reported to the Department of Family Services went down is down by 50%. So are we saying that abuse has gone down in, in families um, um, because schools aren't there to report them or when the students are there are home 24 seven? Um, I, I don't believe that'd be a case. So you look at all the trauma and those kind of things that are not being, those students are not being helped. You look at those students who don't have the ability to have a person at home to help them with assignments, to keep them focused, to keep them on track. And those students are going to fall further behind. I think that we are probably on the precipice of the largest um, education gap between the haves and have nots in history, because those who can provide at home are providing at home. Those who can't, you know, are just trying to put food on the table and trying to do what they do the best they can. And I think as a public education, we have to continue to strive for, um, you know, what is best. And we know that in person is best. And if the numbers are showing that it's a high risk, currently there hasn't been a death of a student um, under the age of 18 in Massachusetts. There's not a recorded um, death in the last time I checked. So when you start talking about statistics and, and putting students at risk, um, I am concerned that we have to make sure that staff are safe. And so, um, you know, we start really looking at statistics and when you're looking at statistics in our in our four towns, um, you know, the, the caseload is so low that we have to look at the, the other, you know, the other um, things that, that happen while we're protecting ourselves from a virus, what's happening to the rest um, of things. And so I think that's the big argument that's out there. And it is our job, it is my job, and I've told people this, is to push forward other models. It's easy for me to just say remote. Remote is, it's, it's a lot easier. We don't have to have all these discussions. We don't have to have all these fears. We don't have to probably could save money. We don't have to put all the, the different PPEs in place and protections, um, that kind of thing. But it's not, um, it's not the best education model. And so that's where we're, we're struggling through. And we're doing that, and that's why we're having these discussions. So it's an excellent question. Um, one that we're not going to have an answer to here, but that's the reasoning by why the school is putting out these other options. 
Next question from Janet Pompili. Is after school still going to be offered for families? You unmuted, Sarah. I was gonna just, I'll jump in, but as I was gonna say, no, not this time. But yeah, that, that was going to be my answer also, um, as uh, similar to what is happening with the sports front with waiting till September 14th. Um, we really are trying to keep those cohorts as separate as possible so that we're not having any undue mixing. Um, so we'll probably follow the MIAA lead and um, see what happens there. And I, and I do want to jump on what Sarah said there. There is some stuff that we just have to figure out and what it looks like. And there is also in that hybrid model, the idea that you, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety in all of us. Um, here's a few out there who don't have any, but I imagine most of us have anxiety and getting some level of routine in place and then slowly working things back in where there's comfort. Because I, you know, I know Janet um, overseas um, after school, um, you know, in the library, kids sitting alone at, at a table doing homework be waiting to pick, be picked up. Well, maybe we can work something like that out after we get things running and people are feeling safe and secure about the, you know, the rules and procedures we put in place. So and that, and also talking about the elementaries as well, you know, the after school program there, you know, we, again, we have to get one thing established and a level of comfort before we move on to the next uh, and continue to add on to, as we move closer to, to some, some level of normalcy. Um, whether or not we get to that full complete normalcy, even this year is a question. Next question for Heidi Moriarty. Will band and chorus students need to take something else to fill their schedule? So currently, once again, band and chorus are not necessarily completely off the table. We're also we're exploring remote options if need be. So so right now, um, the answer to that question is is prop is no. Um, I, we want to be able to keep it uh, in some fashion. And if there's a way that we could make it happen remotely, we'd, we'd actually like to do that. Next question from Olivia Leon. Will there be woodworking? Is it possible for that room to be made safe or not? Yeah, it's going to fall under the same kind of guidelines as our science labs. Um, so woodworking may look different next year um, because we're going to try to minimize the sharing of equipment and the sharing of tools. So the project students are working on may be different. Um, um, but yeah, it's another detail we're still working out. But yes, we do think we can, there's plenty of space in there to spread students out. And so it's a question of what kind of projects they're gonna be working on. All right. Next question uh, from Diane Cassidy, uh, and Diane, we did we did address this a little earlier, but it might be helpful to restate for folks what will happen uh, if a teacher or student tests positive. Um, will the class stay within the class? Will they stay home for fourteen days? So I ask Meg to answer that, Meg. Go ahead. Yeah. So. Um, the guidelines that came out on Friday um, from DESE, which are actually, I, I meant to mention earlier, they are now linked um, in uh, the, the draft return plan in the health and safety section. Um, their DESE guidelines is what they're named. Um, so they, they are, there are very clear um, criteria for if um, there is a known positive, uh, the, the contacts of that positive will stay home for 14 days. Um, there is a provision for um, a test partway through that time and a return. I know um, there are a lot of questions about allowing a return before 14 days, and there was a lot of pushback on the statewide call um, today. Um, I don't, if, if, if we don't have to follow that, I'm going to say everybody stays home for the 14 days. Um, and in terms of somebody who's home uh, with that they tested positive, whether they're symptomatic or not, there's clear criteria for when they can return. And they actually, um, the return, the release from isolation, if you're um, diagnosed with COVID and the release from quarantine, if you're considered to have been exposed, um, that release happens from the Board of Health. Um, and so we will be working very closely with um, all the relevant Board of Health uh, personnel um, for those kinds of situations. Um, and again, my feeling is it's, it's low risk. So if we have any doubts about um, 
about safety, about spread, then the recommendation is going to be to do a um, at least a short term closure, possibly, um, you know, anywhere from one to three days to 14, depending on what we're dealing with. Thank you. Uh, next question um, from Jen Penza. For people who struggle with at-home learning, will will we be will you be looking for tutors? So again, we're um, we don't have a definitive answer on that, but we are looking at every option available. Um, you know, for students that struggle, we're we're really interested in providing them with the most support that we can, and whether that looks like a uh, somebody that's going to kind of move them along through the content and work with them individually or if the state doesn't shut us completely down and we can get some of those learners into the building periodically in small groups to help them along with their education we're exploring all options because we really really want to make this um, a successful experience for students um, some of them lost a good chunk of last spring and we are very interested in having that not happen again for students. So we're gonna get as creative as we can. And if that's tutoring or if that's um, a different solution for students, then we're going to be exploring all of those options. And just to quickly answer Jen, Jen um, you would contact us here at the school, uh, any one of us, and we can, we can pass that along if you're interested in being a tutor if we need so. Uh, next question from Cheryl Risley. At this time, are we planning for a fall model? Uh, full or fall? Let me start over. Let me ask. At this time, are we planning for a fall hybrid model and then for fully remote in winter? So we're not specifically, the state has asked us to develop those three plans so that we are able to move to any one of those plans in fall. We think the most realistic plan at this moment for getting kids into the building in person is that hybrid model. Um, but the state may come back to us and say, um, listen, you need to start with remote because the numbers have gone here um, or it's OK to start in person um, at this point. Uh, we are not specifically planning for a remote model in the winter, um, but given what happens typically with flu season, um, there is a lot of information out there that suggests that at some point we may be moving back to a remote model and whether that's late fall or winter you know in an, in an ideal world they'll develop a vaccine and we can be moving towards a more fuller um, or a more comprehensive in-person model uh, so it's really going to all depend on what happens out there uh, with this pandemic and, and I've said at the just to jump in, Scott, the other meeting, you know, those the two months, let's say that we do have to go back to remote. I still think the importance of creating some relationships as we think back to, you know, I think all the parents out there listening that you think back to the teachers that made a difference in your education it's the ones you had relationships with. And so that's part of the in-person model that we're also kind of um, even in the hybrid section where you can create some relationships. So then when you go to remote you know the persons, I said in a meeting the other day, you know the, the students' quirks, you know the student, you know you know a little bit more about each other in, um, to move things along. So there is, even if we can get a couple months out of it, I think it's important, I think it's gonna be helpful. Um, it, won't, it wouldn't be wasted effort if, we're, if we just have to go back to remote, at least in my mind. <clears throat> Next question from Darren Gray. Hi Darren, will there be a training to start the school year for use of computer applications for remote and how PowerSchool will be used, et cetera? for teachers and students uh, this past spring with remote learning hitting so quickly, how technology was used as well as expectations from teachers varied? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, yes, we are planning a lot of training for both teachers because we are coming up to speed on this new learning platform, Schoology, and also for students. And that's another reason why we're hoping that we can get into the building for a period of time so that we can really establish those routines for students. And we can also train families on how to use Schoology um, ahead, of, ahead of time. And so by having a hybrid where we have students in person for a couple of days, we can really work with them um, individually and by class to make sure that they understand what the expectations are around remote learning. And Sarah, just to add to that, I, I just we we've already started doing we've already started trainings with the staff on Schoology, so um, so that's already started as well. So we're we're very happy about that. 
Next question from Dodie Cullen. Will staff have to be tested every so often like healthcare facilities? Not at this time. We, we don't have the resources to test them in that manner. Um, if, unless something changes from the state, that would not be the requirement. Demag, is there anything else you want to throw on that? That's in your... Yeah, I, I just want to add that, I mean, that that question has come up in some of the statewide uh, calls I've been on with DPH, um, and um, they're very clear that schools are not um, set up to do testing, and they don't see that as um, as a viable way to do it. Um, so it, it, it it's not part of the planning. It's a different exposure kind of setting, too. Uh, next question from uh, Kennedy Cocott. Are students going to receive actual grades or will there be credit, no credit again? No, our plan at this time is for students to receive actual grades. Um, the only reason we were credit, no credit last spring is because the state um, strongly advised that we go that route. And I think the state has changed its plan also, but we are planning at this moment to go with actual grades. All right, and uh, that answers the following question. Uh, so at this point, I don't see any other questions on the screen. Uh, the answer about uh, testing, Jennifer, is is teachers, it was asked, Dodie Cullen asked if, if, if uh, teachers and faculty and staff were gonna be tested regularly. And the answer is no, because we don't have the capacity and we're not set up as a as, as that kind of facility um if that answers your question it was about testing for covid oh, if someone tests positive will the class if, if someone tests positive will they have to stay home yes they would you know that was from before scott you know what i remember back now there was a two-part question i remember only answered one part so okay. if somebody is tested positive, and Meg's going to jump in on this because she just she just wrote this thing up uh, or translated it from the state today or yesterday. <clears throat> so if a student tests positive, um, anybody in that learning cohort, um, staff or student, any other um, known contacts, you know, we're we're going to be having to really monitor where people are um, in the various buildings any other contacts will be identified and then we will be working with the local board of health. Any close contacts um, are going to um, be in quarantine. And the, and the question that we're still trying to tease out is, um, you know, if we have a cohort where we're fairly certain that, you know, I don't know, I'm imagining a kindergarten class where they come in from the outside and they haven't gone anywhere else in the building, we can might be pretty sure we, know exactly who could have possibly been exposed um any high reading i'm not sure what that means jennifer oh a fever um yeah no if somebody has a fever they're going to go home and they're going to be referred for testing um and i you know i think um yeah, you know, why don't you email me about specific questions? I'm I, the symptom list that um, are in the are in the guidance, and we do have a screening document in our guidance. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to be challenging. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna have the normal kinds of things that kids come to the school nurse for. Um, I'm Meg Burtz. I'm the school nurse, uh, district nurse leader and uh, part-time nurse at uh, building-based nurse at Conway. Uh, my email is margaret.birch um, and Birch is BU. I'll put it in the chat. Um, but, you know, it, that's, that is going to be a challenging um, part of this because sometimes figuring out is this sniffles because it's allergies, is this sniffles because it's an early COVID sign. We're going to use the information from DPH, we're gonna work with our local board of health um, and we're gonna use our clinical judgment um, and we're gonna be cautious. So it's, again, health is the primary, is gonna be the primary goal from my perspective. And next one from 
Raja, how will the psychological impact of mask wearing and behavioral changes normal school routine be monitored and supported? Long pause, so I'm trying to figure out exactly where that, where, how we pull that out in our, in our plan. I mean, I think there's a lot of looking at the social and emotional um, re-entry of students and monitoring that by all our, from our adjustment counselors to our school psychologists um, who developed that portion of our plan um, to, to keep an eye on how students are doing and with those check-ins. So um, within that, I mean, it's kind of a vague overview, but it, you know, we did, it is in our plan um, that those groups are gonna be monitoring how students are doing. Um, as, as, as we always do, our teachers will be monitoring how students are doing and getting feedback is from there as well. Um, so I think it falls under there. Sarah, you got a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a, an important component. Um, as we previously mentioned, students have been out of school for a long time and just getting back into their routines um, is gonna be helpful for them, but we're gonna spend a lot of time um, concentrating on their social and emotional health and make sure that they're in a, in a good place as they come back. Uh, next question from Boyana Dragicevich. Why do our four towns with single digit COVID exposures have to follow state guidelines established by the more populous areas? Any local authority, is there any local authority to monitor our guidelines based on our local situation? So our local authority, we are local boards of health. Um, you know, which we'll be working with on this, this plan. Uh, we'll be go through them for approval, but since we're following the state guidelines, it, it probably shouldn't be a problem. I mean, it's a good, I mean, it's a good point in the sense that, you know, we have been, our communities have been hit less. Um, and um, I think still, I think our model, you know, has to fall within this, the state guidelines because that's what we have to work off of. You know, I'll be honest, I have, you know, a lot of families are, are concerned even with the low numbers that we do have. So, it's kind of creating a balance between the two. I think you can see how we're trying to come through the middle there. So, um, but I, I, I have heard that argument that we have such a low occurrence rate in our four towns. Although our community is larger than our four towns, I just want people to realize our teachers and our students of school choice, which we have over 150 of, do come out from outside of our four towns. And um, they are part of our community. So we have to consider those numbers as well. So it's not as low, but it is still significantly low. Um, so I know I didn't completely answer your question there, but. That looks like it's it for questions. Great. Um, so let me kind of tell you the process moving forward is that, um, oh. you know, we're gonna have this discussion. What? Hold on, Darius, so two more people jumped in. Um, has Desi or DPH said if families will also need to stay home with a child in a cohort if the child's been in in a cohort where someone is tested positive? Desi hasn't addressed that particular um, scenario. Um, the, the public health nurses and um, they, that's, that's a question that's dealt with um, routinely. Um, if somebody is, if, and I'm, I'm, Scott, you read the question and I'm trying to um, make sure I'm answering it correctly. If, if somebody is exposed and staying home um, in quarantine. Will their families also have to stay? Right, home? And, and, and part of that is gonna be based on the nature of the exposure, that determination. Um, certainly if somebody tests positive, um, then the members of the household are asked to quarantine. Um, next question from Clint Phillips. Once a model is set on how the school will open, will there be another meeting set up to go over the final guidelines? And that's what I was trying to say. Well, I was trying to close the meeting. I was the process here. So let me talk about that process. Then we can, we, then those are people who are um, um, Kind of itching to, to, to it's been an hour and a half here to get off the meeting they can and we can continue to answer any last ones that are there um so again we're still taking feedback and you can still use that feedback that feedback form on on the as part of the plan that i sent out um so um the school committee again is meeting next week um they are meeting next wednesday i believe um frontier is and um to discuss this these plans further much like we're talking about tonight but 
um, a little bit more you know, focused in as we get closer. And then we'll be voting on um, a decision that first week in August about the direction we're gonna go. From there, we will have more, another, it won't be a town meeting, it'll be a parent meeting because we'll be kind of giving an outline of what the decision is and how that's going to affect your child and then put out a survey that says we need you to commit to what your plan is um, moving forward. Are you gonna choose a remote option or in, that, in this particular case, if the school committee says they want us to move forward with a hybrid option, I mean, the school committee could say, we want to just go forward with the remote option. Or they, they, I don't know how we would pull off the everyone in person, but technically it's on the, it's on the, it's on the ticket. So um, we, would, we would ask parent parents to commit to what their children will be doing. And then we will um, you know, have meetings about each of those things about how that will work. So it's a lot, a lot of stuff to do and it's gonna happen very quickly as we take this information, August is going to be a very busy month for the schools. I already told my administrators take your vacations earlier because it's going to be a busy month. Um, and um, information is going to be fast and furious. And I apologize to parents for that, but we're giving it to you almost as fast as we're getting it. Sarah, am I missing anything? I on mute. Yeah, I just wanted to um, just let everyone know we did send out a survey um, of just a few days ago, actually asking people to just tell us, tell us what you're thinking now about your plans for the fall. We understand that those plans can change. And we are having our uh, school administrative assistants call homes uh, for people that we haven't heard back from yet. And I, we understand that this is your best guess for the fall, but we're really trying to get some ideas about the numbers of students that we should plan re for remote learning only options. Uh, so we really appreciate the fact that so many of you filled out that survey. We had um, over a thousand from the district and we have about 1500 students. So it was a huge response rate and thank you so much. I think there's one final question. I just gotta find it again. From Holly Johnson, what's the Deerfield Board of Health saying? I know there's been they've been strict with the library opening, uh, even just the curbside. So I am on um, biweekly meetings with the local all four towns boards of health and leadership discussing what's moving forward. Um, they have the draft of our plan. You know they are working with us since our plan is working with the Department of Public Health in the state. It's kind of like this kind of they're helping set this. So our plan is falling into those parameters. So. Um, we are all working together. I mean, I was on conversation today um, with Carolyn Ness this afternoon um, in regards to um, our reopening plan. So, you know, so we're, we're talking with them. It's no surprise that we're in communication each step of the way. Um, but again, because we're coming from the State Board of Health and, and so on and so forth, um, Department of Health rather, um, there's no, we're not kind of doing something that's outside of what's the parameters of what they're expecting. I think that's it. We do appreciate the thank yous. Um, <laughs> I, I really do appreciate everybody who, who, who came on tonight, 150 something. That's a tremendous amount of people taking time um, and giving us good questions and feedback. Um, I really do appreciate it. Any other ministers want to say how much you love your community? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. coming. We it's love you all. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we well, really appreciate you. it. All right. Thank you, everyone.